Welcome to the first of our talks in the Y series. What you're about to see is a lecture which was given as part of a whole day where we've tried to take one of the questions which we feel come up again and again that poets have speculated about, novelists have written on, we watch on the news and we experience in our lives. That's the question of suffering. The very first of these talks will be given by Amy or Ewing, where she will be asking the question, where is God in our suffering? She'll be looking at the nature of our free will, the nature of God, and how those two things ultimately fit together, as well as exploring briefly how other faiths attempt to answer the very same question. I hope you enjoy this talk and the others in the series, and that it will help this exploration of this subject of suffering. It's my privilege to begin this day um, talking about this awesome subject that affects all of us. In the last few years and even months alone, we in this room have heard all sorts of horror stories about the pain and suffering and evil in the world. We'll have probably followed the trial of, of those involved in the sexual and physical, physical abuse of thousands of young girls in a town in the north of England. And perhaps we followed a similar story um, in the north of Nigeria, where Boko Haram have systematically targeted young women. We've seen pictures on our TV screens of the beheading of Western journalists and aid workers with a butcher's knife. We perhaps heard last week of the stabbing of a schoolboy on a bus filled with children, just here in London, in West Norwood. And although all of us here today in our lives will have happy experiences, joy-filled experiences, we know that evil is real, it is at large in our world. We know that out there, external to us. But perhaps we also know the darkness of the world closer to home. Many of us struggle with feelings of anxiety, disappointment, broken relationships, perhaps the struggle to process violations of our personal dignity. The darkness of the world that you and I know is real. This darkness was experienced by my friend three years ago, who lost her child, her baby died. This darkness was experienced by my husband who was abandoned as a small child by his mother. This darkness is being experienced currently by my cousin who at 35 has just received a terminal diagnosis for cancer. The real darkness of our world and in our experience is not something that any of us should be prepared to sweep under the carpet. This question of suffering is of critical importance to life. And today, over the course of this day, we're all going to be bringing different experiences of pain, disappointment, even suffering to the table. And as the day progresses, as a team, we want to keep that practical, visceral reality in mind and not to avoid it. Now, often when people think about people of faith in our culture, we understand and see people of faith as people who sort of embrace fantasy. Faith is seen as a kind of uh, embracing of unreality that might help you get through the pain of life. Perhaps faith is, is seen as a, as a kind of drug that lifts you out of the pain for a while, or a kind of comfort blanket that's a bit like a hallucinogenic that we, we wrap around ourselves to live in a fantasy world. But the Bible does not describe a fantasy delusional world. The Bible describes a world in which there is joy and love, but also a world in which terrible and sad things happen to ordinary people. I have three kids, so I like this story. The story is told of a little um, girl who was six years old and she was doing a project on birth at school. And she came home to her mother and she said, Mummy, how did I come to be born? 
The mother was a bit embarrassed. She wasn't ready to have that conversation with her daughter. So she said, well, darling, a big fat bird called a stork flew over our back garden and dropped you in a blanket into, into our garden. And I opened the door and brought you into our home. The girl looked a bit worried and said, well, mummy, how did you come to be born? The woman, not knowing how to stop digging out of this hole, said, well, darling, a big fat bird flew over granny's back garden and a baby was dropped and I was taken into the home. The girl went back to school the next day and wrote in her project, there hasn't been a natural birth in our family for three generations. <laughs> As human beings, we can have a tendency to avoid facing difficult realities. The Bible does not do that around issues of pain and suffering. The objective of Christian faith is not to help you soothe away your trouble, give you some hallucinogenic palliative, not to pretend that all is well when it isn't, not to dull the pain, but rather to see reality and grasp the root of our problem. So why would a loving God allow suffering? Is there an explanation? If God is there and he's loving, why do all these bad things happen? Now let me begin by saying there are loads of layers to addressing this, and we're going to be coming at this question from different angles and experiences today. For some, this is primarily an intellectual question. How could there be a loving God if the world is so messed up? Doesn't the dilemma mean that an all-powerful good God couldn't actually exist since the suffering and evil that we observe implies he's either not powerful enough since he hasn't dealt with it or he's not loving enough since he hasn't dealt with it. But for some of us, it's not primarily an intellectual question. It's a personal question. Given what I have experienced, given what my friends or family have experienced or what I'm going through right now, where is God? And this talk is just going to be a, a beginning to beginning to answer that question. But I want to start by saying and suggesting that it isn't only Christian faith that needs to answer this. Every point of view, every worldview needs to respond to why and how there is suffering in the world. And in fact, it can help us see the Christian point of view by looking, observing what others believe. So briefly, how do other worldviews answer this question? If we were to take Islam, we'd realize Islam is a fatalistic religion, teaching a, a transcendent God exists who's in control of the universe. Human beings do not have free will. There's only one will in the universe, and it is Allah's will. That's why you'll hear that word, inshallah, a lot. And that can be surprising to confront a friend of mine was involved in um, the British Army coaching the Iraqi army um, and uh, trying to sort of raise up a, a local army there. And he described an experience that occurred during a training exercise whilst there. It was a survival exercise, and they were standing on the edge of a swimming pool. Two um, Iraqis had been chosen to go through this exercise and they were loaded up with equipment and wearing the full clothes, the boots, the, the uniform, etc. And they were going to be pushed into the swimming pool and then they needed to swim to the surface. That was the, that was the exercise. The exercise was explained. The two recruits were standing on the edge of the pool. They were pushed in and they dropped like stone to the bottom of the pool. One of them struggled up to the surface and got out, but one of them just remained at the bottom. My friend described the panic rising in, in those doing the training as they saw this guy not moving at all, and someone dived in, took the pack off, took the boots off, and dragged the guy to the surface, slapped him on the back, out came the water out of his lungs, and they shouted at him, why didn't you swim? And he shrugged his shoulders, and he said, inshallah. I figured if it was God's will that I lived, I would live. If it was God's will that I died, I would die. And clearly it's God's will that I live since you rescued me. <laughs> God is in total control. It's utterly deterministic. Well, in Eastern philosophy and Buddhism, we see something slightly different. A distinction between good and evil is ultimately illusory since all of life is one. This ultimate impersonal reality, Brahman. 
And the Buddha even left his wife and newborn child on the night his child was born to seek enlightenment into that reality that all of life is one, away from emotional bonds. Enlightenment, essentially disconnection from everything except the realization that all of life is one and that that one is both ultimate and impersonal. And so trying to make sense of suffering is a failure to understand that suffering is just an illusion. Suffering comes from desire, from wanting something at all. And so the answer is to expunge desire, to cease wanting the things, to reach that state of enlightenment, a kind of nothingness. It's highly theoretical and impersonal, and it's one approach, although it doesn't explain the why of our suffering or really meet us in it. Well, what about naturalism? Atheists have often argued that if God was real, he wouldn't allow suffering. Suffering is real, therefore God isn't there. But isn't the question of suffering and evil itself a moral question? How can these bad things happen? The very question assumes a moral framework. God's existence is called into question on the basis of moral judgments that suffering is bad and that he lets the bad things happen. But such moral judgment requires an objective moral law in order to contrast good and evil. Yet philosophers argue if a moral law exists by logical consequence, isn't there a moral law giver greater than us? Thus, paradoxically, some would argue that the fact of the reality of evil in the world can actually be used to argue for the existence of God. Now, they meant, that may not help me in the dark watches of the night, but it's important that the very objection of atheism that suffering and evil are a disproof of God assumes the reality of the God it is trying to disprove. Now, some will say, well, hold on a minute, can't we have morality without God? Can't we behave morally without God? This is a question, an issue of the grounding and the logic of morality. For naturalists, morality is not located objectively in God, but subjectively in personal preference or societal taboo. Dawkins famously said, we supply our own basis for ethics. But when you look at the suffering of the world, ask yourself whether that answer is adequate. Don't Daesh believe in what they are doing in Syria? Who are we to say that what they're doing is wrong? Don't racists believe they're morally right in their delusions of superiority? Yet racist societies have legalized such notions. Who are we to say they are wrong? It's only if there's a God that there is a moral lawgiver who transcends personal preference and character. And then it's only that, that under that sense that good and evil are real in an absolute sense. For the naturalist, human life doesn't carry that essential sacredness. Life is an accident. And so our outrage in the face of suffering perhaps could be questioned since human beings don't have intrinsic worth. Peter Singer argues, without God, humans have no more value than any other animal and no more moral sense. He goes on, whatever the future holds, it is, it is likely to prove impossible to restore in full the sanctity of life view. We can no longer base our ethics on the idea that human beings are a special form of creation made in the image of God, singled out from other animals. Our better understanding of our own nature has bridged the gulf that was once thought to lie between ourselves and other species. So why should we believe that the mere fact that a being is a member of the species Homo sapiens endows its life with some unique, almost infinite value? Does human life have value? Can you stand in the gates of Auschwitz and shrug in the same way that you might in the doorway of an abattoir? If it is the case that there is no God, why do we as human beings care about darkness, 
the massacres, the hunger, the injustice or sufferings of other human beings, the strong eliminating the weak. Why does darkness hurt us? Why does it matter? From where do we get the essential sense of our worth and dignity as of human beings? Our outrage in the face of suffering, including of people that we've never met, speaks of our intuitive sense that there's more to life than atheism tells us. Well, if God is there, and atheism, Islam, Buddhism have their explanations and, and ways of processing suffering, what does the Bible have to say? What does the Christian faith have to say about this question? Well, it comes as a surprise to lots of people that the Bible doesn't deny the reality of both evil and suffering, including in the lives of people who are believers in God. The portrait of the world that the Bible describes is not one of cotton wool and fluffy bunnies and niceness. The pain of human experience is explored in the text of this book. We read questions like, why do good people succeed? We read of the agonizing question, why can't I have children? We read of anxiety, aloneness, lamentation and grief over mass casualty in war. We read of grief over rape. We read of tears at the death of close friends. But why would God allow this? Well, the Bible talks about human beings being created in the image of God, that there is a God-likeness about us and that our lives are essentially valuable. The Bible's response to that question, why, is rooted in our will as human beings. The Bible talks of a good God creating a good world and specifically making creatures who have the capacity to love. And for love to exist, freedom must exist. I remember as a teenager growing up in Birmingham, I became friends with a girl whose parents were trying to force her into a marriage with someone she didn't know. She was 15, I was 15, and she was terrified. And she had very good reason to be afraid. The previous year, her cousin had been in the same situation and had tried to run away. And their relatives had found where she was and had taken the car and knocked her down in the street, dragged her back by her hair, and she'd never been heard from again. My friend Shabs, at 15, knew that she did not want that for her life. I remember talking to her and hearing her express this desire as a 15-year-old that at some point in my life, I want to be loved and to love. And she felt that being forced into a legal partnership against her will with someone she didn't know and then effectively raped on a regular basis was the antithesis of love. She believed that she had an innate capacity, a possibility of giving and receiving love that could not and should not be compelled by another person. And friends helped her to get to a safe house, and she's gone on and lived her life. For true love to be possible, it must be freely offered and received. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. Free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. Genesis tells us of a God who is love, who made a world in which love is possible. But that means a world in which there is freedom. And as human beings, we've exercised that freedom to harm as well as to love. And that is why there is suffering in the world. Genesis describes the impact of the choices human beings have made on ourselves, on other people, and on the very environment of the earth. But the Bible doesn't just address the question of why bad things happen. There's a deeper kind of answer in Christian faith and specifically in the person of Jesus. Because at the cross, God has entered the suffering world that he's seen. He's entered it and he bears the darkness and the sin of the world. The God of love doesn't observe our suffering and feel sorry for us or even feel empathy for us. He comes to suffer with us. 
And that's why the cross is so amazing. A cartoon has been found on a wall in the ruins of um, ancient Rome showing how paradigm-shattering the cross was in the ancient world. The cartoon is a caricature of Jesus' crucifixion. It shows a man's body hanging on a cross, but the body has the head of a donkey. And underneath this grotesque image is an inscription. And there's a young man kneeling down, looking up at this horrible image, and the inscription reads, he worships his God. A crucified God. A God who would not behave as other deities, demanding oblations, requiring sacrifices, moral behaviours, but a God who loves to the extent that he himself would choose to suffer, to be defiled, humiliated, who would humble himself, take the dirt of the world upon himself in order to rescue us without demanding him anything of us, without forcing us into a relationship, but offering us the possibility of forgiveness and love through his own suffering. When Christians think about the problem of pain, when we think about the question of suffering, we look through the lens of a God who doesn't observe our suffering and feel pity from a distance, who doesn't merely provide a kind of explanatory framework. This is the way things are, and this is how that came to be. But a God who actually loves us in the real suffering world we all know and experience. John's Gospel uses the metaphor of a shepherd to describe God's loving interaction with humanity and how that's worked out and contrasts two kinds of shepherds. A false one who is ultimately led by self-interest in leading the sheep. And when the, f- the well-being of that false shepherd is in any way threatened, that shepherd will endanger the sheep in order to protect himself. But in contrast, the good shepherd leads his sheep out of harm and into safety, even to the point of laying his life down for the sheep. Why? Because he loves them. I wonder if you've ever fallen madly in love or someone close to you has fallen madly in love. It's an overwhelming experience And it makes you realize what a massive difference love makes to everything. Have you seen parents who are passionately loving of their children, more interested in them than themselves? Love is recognizable. We know it when we see it. Love puts the other first and doesn't care who knows it. Self-interest dies in the presence of real love. And Jesus shows us that in his death. Even as he suffers, love pours out of him. The cross tells us of a God who doesn't just explain suffering, doesn't just observe suffering, but who comes to be with us, to be with us in this suffering world and to take it upon himself, not abandoning us, but rescuing us. A few years ago, I found myself in the no man's land between Afghanistan and Turkmenistan. I'd been on a trip meeting the top brass of the Taliban in their military headquarters and giving them Bibles. It's a story for another time. But on our way out on the journey, we got stuck in this no man's land, a kilometer, mines, landmines on either side, and we weren't able to get through the border. And suddenly, a sandstorm um, sort of erupted, and it was three o'clock in the afternoon. It was utterly terrifying. It went from a situation of being boiling hot with the sun beating on you to suddenly completely dark. It was so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And it went on for hours. We were alone. We were disorientated. We were afraid. And I will never forget seeing two headlights shine, pierce through that sandstorm as a Red Cross truck came and rescued us. The relief that someone had come for us. That is what the cross tells us God has done. He comes for us into our suffering world. He's with us. 
Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He overcomes the light. I've seen him do this in the lives of teenagers caught up in gang violence in London here. I've seen him do this in the lives of young people caught up as the victims of paedophile rings in London. I've seen him do this in extraordinarily middle-class rich bankers' lives too. The Bible is not just an explanation of why suffering happens, because in Christ we receive encounter, help, rescue in the dark world that we know. The possibility of love leaves open the possibility of suffering, but God doesn't leave us there alone in explanation. He himself comes. Jesus demonstrates God's love for us, offering us that relationship that we've been created for. Thank you for listening. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. We're going to dive straight into some questions, and thanks to you all for making my job uh, easy by sending in so many uh, good questions. So we're going to jump straight to the top vote-getter on Pigeonhole, and that is, why is it that God sometimes intervenes to end suffering, and other times he does not? I think that question is brilliant. That's a question I've asked um, a lot myself. If um, the argument that I'm making to you is that the reason that there's evil and suffering in the world is about our free, our free will, our will, how comes God sometimes appears to override that or mess with the system but doesn't do it kind of universally? And I think for Christians, um, the answer to that question is rooted in Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God. Jesus taught that In him, as he entered history, the kingdom of God had arrived on earth. But he also spoke about God's kingdom as something future. One of the things I didn't have time to touch on was that the Bible looks at suffering through the lens of the past explanation, but also through the lens of the future, that there will be a day of judgment, that there will be a day of reckoning when all things are made right. And at that point... When there is a day of judgment, God will wipe tears from our eyes. There's a promise of, of ultimate eternal comfort. I don't know if you've ever wiped tears from someone's eyes. I did it yesterday. My 10-year-old was crying because he hadn't made a particular sports team he wanted to be in. Big, fat, gigantic tears pouring down his face. It's amazingly intimate to be there to do that as you embrace someone. That's the promise of what God will do for us at the end. But we live in this tension, which theologians called the now and the not yet. Jesus' kingdom has come, but it is also coming. So where we see miracles, where we see divine salvations and interventions that deliver us or rescue us in some way, those are the future that promise, that reality of eternity where all is well breaking into the present. Now, how and why that happens is mysterious. One thing we do know, though, is that that miracle occurring is not in any way related to our performance. There's no sense in which, okay, well, here's a really, really good Christian, and they're suffering, so because they've been extra good, or the people who prayed for them really, really prayed hard, they're going to be healed. But here's a slightly less good Christian, they're not going to be healed. It's absolutely not related to performance. But a miracle is a sign of that future reality breaking in that we're not in control of. It's a message from God to show us that this is true and real, not a badge of, well done you, you've performed well, you've got a miracle. So that's how I would understand it. It's in this tension of the past and the future, the now and the not yet. Great, thank you. Uh, the second one, it, it's, it's somewhat related to that. I have it both on a card and on pigeonhole, and well done voting so much, I can't keep up with where we are. <laughs> but the next one, which is, uh, it was the third or fourth one on pigeonhole, also on the card, is um, if I'm suffering, does Christianity say it is my fault? Probably a question every one of us has asked at some point. Yeah. I think that's um, deeply related to that question, why me? Why is this happening to me? 
I think probably all of us who've been through any kind of painful experience, I went through a number of miscarriages before having my children. And I remember asking that question consistently, why me? Is there some sort of something specifically wrong with, um, with what I've done? And I think we need to be incredibly careful here. There is absolutely no view of karma in the Christian worldview. There's a whole book called the Book of Job in the Old Testament devoted to telling the story of a righteous person who loses everything, his family, his health, his wealth. He loses everything. And at the end of this, Job is utterly vindicated by God. In contrast... You look at an Eastern view of karma, you may remember the um, England football manager, Glenn Hoddle, who um, spoke about reincarnation, the idea of reincarnation. He said, you and I have been physically given two hands and two legs and half-decent brains. Some people are not born like that for a reason. The karma is working from another lifetime. In other words, if you're suffering, you deserve it. There's absolutely no view of that um, in the Bible. So why might a Christian or another person experience suffering. Well, it may be that we are suffering the consequences of our own folly. Perhaps we've chain smoked and we end up with lung cancer, or perhaps we've cheated on our spouse, had an affair, and our marriage is over. That is some suffering that is related to our own folly. But more frequently, we suffer at the hands of others. We experience other people abusing their will and perpetrating things against us. Choice and freedom abused. And as we've seen, to make love possible, that's the reality of the world that we live in. The Bible also talks about righteous people suffering for causes, either being persecuted in some way or suffering in the cause of justice. So we may never understand why. What we are promised is that coming to Jesus is not a ticket out of the suffering world. There's no sense of become a Christian, you'll be healthy, you'll be wealthy, you'll be middle class, you'll have a job, everything will go well with you. The greatest saints in scripture suffer. So we wrestle with it. We don't draw the conclusion that this is karma. We remember that God is with us in our suffering in Jesus. Great. Currently second place. How can we tell the young minds today who suffer from depression, self-harming, and suicide that God is with them everywhere they go? Again, that's a question that really touches me in the work that I do, um, often working with young people and young adults. I think in the last five years, it is observable the epidemic levels of anxiety disorders and that, um, that absolutely deep sense that all is not well, whether that's diagnosed as, as depression or some kind of other outworking, perhaps self-harm. And um, it's related to a a lot of things. I saw a study um, recently published in the Huffington Post talking about um, 80% of women in London having received unwanted sexual harassment um, on, on transport in London. 80% and beginning from as young as 12. So the world that we're living in is, um, is a difficult place to be, to be a young person. I think um, the encouragement I would want to offer is, number one, God's love for you is not related to your performance. And often I think what people hear in the church is another message, do this, do that, and all will be well with you. Achieve this moral standard and God might be happy with you. The foundation of of the gospel, because of who Jesus is and what he did at the cross, is you are loved. The second foundation is that Suffering is a normative experience. So if you're, if you're thinking, I've got an anxiety disorder, I'm depressed, there's something wrong with me, and there's something totally different about me from everyone in the Bible or everyone in church, that's a category mistake. Jesus meets us in the real world where we are. So to encourage a young person that um, not to make their experience small, but to say, We recognize that experience. We understand, we care that you feel like that. And then I think thirdly, to um, practically, as well as with words, but practically to demonstrate um, love and empathy, encouragement, consistent relationship, um, perhaps even um, therapy of some kind um, to help.
Just one more question uh, for now. This one's a little further down, 12 votes, uh, but I've found your response to this question before um, really helpful. So uh, a nice easy one to end with, Amy. Why did God tell the Jews to cause so much suffering for the Canaanites? Thank you, Vince. I think I've got one minute to do that one in. Um, I, mean, I think this is a really important question. It may be something we come back to in, in the panel. When we read the Bible, how do we understand um, acts of violence, particularly in the Old Testament, that God has told people to, to meet out? And I would usually give four headings. We may not give them all, just to give you a framework to think through this question. The first heading would be the concept, the idea of justice, of judgment. Um, when we read the Bible, we don't see a dichotomy between justice and love. Often we think of those as, other, as opposite categories. If God loves people, he's not going to judge them. If you've ever stood alongside a victim of something horrific, some horrendous act of violence, I mean, I could imagine right now, reimagine the conversation I had with uh, that 16-year-old girl who described how her own father had sold her into a paedophile ring of his own friends. And once she got to 16, the age of consent, they just totally discarded her. When you hear someone describe that kind of experience, does love say, oh, well, it doesn't matter what those men did, what that guy did, let's forget about it, just put it out of your mind and get on with your life. No, love calls, cries out for justice and for judgment to occur. And where we see um, uh, acts of violence that God has commanded in the Old Testament, it comes theologically under that heading that great evil has been perpetrated against whole generations and there are hundreds of years um, that, ha that have gone past. Time for an, a nation to repent. But at some point, judgment is going to come. And in the Old Testament, one of the means of God's judgment is, um, is war. The second would be to say that we need to really take care with um, language and, and time context. Often people think, well, this is some kind of justification for other acts of violence. This occurs within a very limited time frame, with a very, within a very specific historical context. And also that the language used is intentionally hyperbolic. And when we read it in translation, we read it generations later, we think, what on earth is going on? He utterly destroyed all who breathed. What on earth does that mean? Well, that phraseology, that terminology is, is rhetorical, and it was recognized as such by people who read it. I could give you an example of, um, again, from my kids. They're amazing tennis players, and um, they play as a team over the summer, and I sometimes have to take them around with, with um, other people's children. And they may go somewhere else to a tennis club and obliterate the opposition. And I have to say to them, before we get out of the car, I don't want to see any Rafa, yeah, you know, when, when you've won the match, or get down on your knees going like this, lying down like Rafa when he's won Wimbledon. That's inappropriate. The nine-year-old on the other side of the net might be crying. I tell you what, when we get back in the car, you're allowed to shout, scream, wave, you know, rejoice as much as you want, but on court, you're just going to shake hands. So we drive away... And one of them, they erupt into Victoria shouting, and one of them says, we slaughtered them. And the other one says, I'm over the moon. Now, when I hear that as the mum driving the car, trying not to laugh, do I think that they literally, with knives, slaughtered the other nine-year-olds and there's blood on the tennis court? No. Do I think that they think they've jumped over the moon in joy? No. It's a rhetorical device. When Joshua says he utterly destroyed all who breeds, it goes on to say, well, you know, those who remain and survive, let's think about how intermarriage works. We need to be careful culturally here. So clearly, um, rhetoric has been used there. So three headings that you could think about. Um, and there are lots of, of resources to read further and think about that, that question. Great. What a great start to the day. Let's thank Amy.